This video is part of a webinar series on Hindu Dvesha, an educational series to explore and expose systemic Hindu phobia. I want to uh, begin by welcoming all our uh, panelists. Uh, you know, I uh, want to really appreciate all of you for taking the time and joining us today. Um, my name is Kalyan Vishwanathan. I'm the president of Hindu University of America. Uh, and I, I want to extend a very warm welcome to all the participants. Uh, I'm sure there is uh, more people joining even as I speak. Uh, this webinar is titled, uh, uh, you know, what can Hindus learn from the Jewish Holocaust? It's in fact uh, the first part of a two-part webinar series. So today we are going to hear about the Jewish uh, experience directly from uh, so the members of the Jewish community. And we are very, very fortunate to have with us one of the uh, you know, survivors of the Jewish Holocaust. She's in her 90s, and uh, it's a very uh, special occasion uh, you know, for us to be able to hear directly from someone who's been part of that experience. Now, uh, just briefly, you know, for myself, uh, I, I, for a long time, I just uh, had a very vague idea of what had happened in the World War II. And whatever had happened was too ghastly for me to really explore seriously. It wasn't uh, until much later in my life, I accidentally got interested. And uh, you know, I, I spent a whole week, uh, went onto the Yad Vashe website. And I, uh, I, I got very deeply into studying the uh, events uh, of, of that uh, period in time. It was heart-wrenching for me. It was my initial uh, uh, exploration of uh, those events. Uh, but I have never really heard from a, a Holocaust survivor, so I'm really, really looking forward to today's webinar. Now, for the participants in the webinar, uh, you know, I, I want to tell you a little bit about how to ex uh, listen today to the uh, panelists. You know, we want to um, get in touch with the Jewish experience as much as possible. Uh, we want to, uh, you know, hear from them and see if we can connect with their experience uh, and allow them to speak fully. Uh, and share about their experience and what they have, how they've dealt with it, what led up to it, and you know what has been the aftermath of that experience and so on. So uh, without further uh, ado, I'd like to uh, introduce to you the main uh, sort of the uh, coordinator of this webinar, Dr. Adara Goldberg. Uh, Dr. Adara Goldberg is the director of the Holocaust Resource Center and, and Diversity Council on Global Education and Citizenship at Keene University, New Jersey. She earned her doctorate in Holocaust history at Clark University in the year 2012. She has held an Azraeli Foundation Fellowship at Hebrew University, a postdoc fellowship at Stockton University and has served as the education director for the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center. She's a recipient of the Masjid Foundation Prize at the 2016 Western Canada Jewish Book Awards. And Dr. Goldberg's book, Holocaust Survivors in Canada, Exclusion, Inclusion, Transformation, 1947 to 1955, published in 2015, represented the first comprehensive analysis of the resettlement and integration experiences of 35,000 Holocaust survivors and their families in post-war Canada. 
Dr. Adara Goldberg served as a consultant for the Israeli Foundation and is a featured historian for the Montreal Holocaust Museum virtual exhibition, Building New Lives. Her current research projects explore the phenomenon of post-genocidal familial reconstruction and the role of national apologies in collective memory. With that brief uh, introduction, I'd like to welcome Dr. Adala Goldberg. I'd like to turn it over to you to conduct the webinar uh, from here on. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction and for including me in tonight's program. So my role tonight um, is simple. Luna is the star of the show. But what I'm going to do is take a few minutes to make sure that we all have you know, a sense of the time that we're speaking about. Um, and then I'm going to help moderate questions afterwards. So a few points to help us as we think about the Holocaust. Um, the Holocaust did happen you know, under the guise of World War II, but it in fact began much earlier. So when we think about you know, anti-Semitism and historical anti-Judaism, we have to remember that this is known as you know, the world's oldest hatred and that anti-Semitism is present even in places without Jewish people. Um, but most importantly, perhaps, the Holocaust did not happen overnight. So when Luna shares her story um, and you hear about the particular you know, persecution of her family and her community, I want you to understand that this was um, a long buildup that the organized attempted destruction of European Jewry um, by the Nazis and their collaborators may have took place between the years 1933 and 1945. So you're marking these as the beginning when the Nazi party established power or took power and liberation. Um, we need to see um, experiences of, as life experiences. Um, and understand that you know, those who experienced the Holocaust in Europe experienced it in a variety of ways. Um, so Luna, as you'll find out in a couple of moments, um, came from Poland, um, from Krakow specifically, and had you know, her family. But in fact, the Jewish experience of the Holocaust is not a monolith. And Jewish people across Europe spoke a variety of languages. They observed Judaism, um, in countless different ways, um, as well as you know, their experiences. So you will hear about those you know, who experienced ghettos and concentration camps. But to understand you know, the bigger picture, I encourage you um, to think beyond one country. Um, and then after today's program, you take the time to look up or reach out to me you know, or to our partners at you know, Metro West at the Holocaust Council specifically Elise Shane Brown, who is our partner and the director of you know, Holocaust education, reach out to us to hear other narratives so that we can create as comprehensive um, of a picture as possible. Um, and something that was just said in the introduction that I think is you know, really important for us to all remember is that we do not have the ability to comprehend what happened to individuals who were targeted by the Holocaust um, as well as you know, those, some, those who perished and those who survived. All that we can do is listen to the eyewitness accounts to better educate ourselves so that perhaps we can establish historical empathy for those who've experienced persecution that is different than your own. Um, but again, there's no hierarchy of suffering. The only way that we can create peace in our world is through understanding through respect and open dialogue, um, such as that we're having tonight. And so with that being said, um, I am delighted and privileged to introduce tonight's keynote speaker and our eyewitness. Um, Luna Fuss Kaufman was born in Poland in 1926 to a Krakow family that dated back many generations to 1700. After the outbreak of the Second World War, her family was interned first in the Krakow ghetto and then in the Plaszow concentration camp. Luna's father, her sister, and 70 members of her extended family perished in the camps while Luna and her mother were transferred to um, Skarzysko and then Leipzig where they survived the war. 
and Luna will tell you more about this experience. Um, but what I would like to stress that she may not have time to share with you is the immeasurable contributions that Luna has made to civic society, as well as Jewish life, Holocaust education and remembrance since relocating as an immigrant to the United States. She is a tireless leader in her community. Um, she has you know, numerous accolades that date back to 1981 when she became the first female president of Temple Shalom in Plainfield, um, where she oversaw the installation of the flame. And this was a Holocaust Memorial sculpture that was created by internationally renowned artist, Nathan Rappaport. On the occasion of the unveiling um, of the sculpture, then governor Thomas Kane announced the formation of the Governor's Council on Holocaust Education, of which Luna served as a charter member for 10 years. In addition to this role, Luna has served um, as the overseer of the Liberation Monument that many of us have probably seen in Liberty State Park in Jersey City. She has served as a member of the Mayor's Task Force in Newark for the Performing Arts, a part of the team that created the Holocaust Center at Drew University in New Jersey, and is the co-chair emeritus of the Sister of Seton Hall's Sister Rose Thering Endowment for Jewish, Christian, and Holocaust Studies. And in 2006, Luna published her memoirs, Luna's Life, which she wrote to inspire readers of all faiths and to promote secular and religious cooperation. Her book received numerous recognitions, among them the Benjamin Franklin Award. And so I am now going to turn things over to Luna um, to speak. Um, and I would encourage people to continue using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to post any questions in there so we can address them after Luna. Luna, the floor is yours. Thank you. The world goes around. It's really amazing that uh, the Kane University is a part of this program because this was the first university at which I have become involved in teaching Holocaust. And also, this was the first university that we were creating the Holocaust Center, which functions extremely well, and it was very well received by the community. Let me give you just a brief sketch of my, of my life. <music> Uh, when the war broke out, I, there was my turn to start high school. I just finished sixth grade and I was about to uh, go for further education. And I was very proud because I was going to go to the same school as my sister did, which was a vocational high school, but not in the sense the vocational high schools are here. My father was an Austrian officer who was imprisoned in Russia for a few years during the First War. And as such, he felt that anybody that needs to function in the world should have some profession which he can execute with their hands. So the language will not be necessary because as you know, Europe was divided into many different countries and each country had its own language. And he felt that not uh, having as handicap lack of the communication would be a problem. And this school opened was a very, very sophisticated school where all the subjects were taught like any other high school, any exceptional high school, really good ones. But besides that, we learned to be what you would call is a fashion designers. So no matter where we would find out ourselves in the world, we would be able to make a living because we had some profession in our hands. And uh, this was something that was taught 
at a very, very high, sophisticated level. This was not just, uh, you know, uh, seamstresses. It was fashion design. But that didn't take very long. The strange thing was that we all looked before, before the war at Germany as a country that, I hate to say it, and I hate to make this kind of comparison, but they were the most affiliated, uh, you would compare it most favorably with America, with the, with the liberty, with the education was ex on an extremely high level. And anybody who had a college degree in our family studied either in Vienna or Berlin because the schools were superior and the prejudice was much lesser than it was at the time in Poland. To our biggest surprise, when the war started, all of a sudden we heard German footsteps on the, uh, in the hallway. And it was my father coming with a German officer and he said, look what they're talking about, that the, that the Germans will do some harm to us. This is a friend of mine with whom I served in the first war and we were together in the Russian prison. He is a Viennese man, an Austrian, and he's now in this army and they will do no harm to us. Uh, we learned very fast that that wasn't true. The, one of the big reasons, actually, that Holocaust was so effective was because it was not conducted by any hooligans, any uneducated people. Those were highly educated intellectuals who planned everything in such a way that you didn't have any weapon how to protect yourself. And every time something happened, we always thought that oh, tomorrow will be better once we agree to this step, that will be, that will be all. Little did we know that this wasn't all. And the war progressed at a very rapid phase. The worst thing that happened at the beginning was that they closed the banks. And being that the country was quite free, and uh, was very prosperous. We kept all our money in the banks. Nobody kept money under a, under a mattress or anything like it. So when they closed the banks, so, so they closed our funds to support ourselves. And we started very early by seeking another way of supporting. My mother being a marvelous hostess and a very big baker and cook, was able to bake things, bake some goods and, and cook some goods and sell them. I was always very handy. I always did a lot of knitting and crocheting and this kind of handy work. And also I learned during the war doing beadworks. So I, even at 13, I started kind of a business where I would take two old torn sweaters, take them apart, select the good part of wool and make sweaters combining two different colors in, and developing all kinds of very interesting designs. But everything was a stopgap and everything went very, very fast. You know, and there was no, we didn't have, that time to really get acclimated any place because we were moved from one spot to another. They, they took our piano, they, they did not, they came to take our piano away. I was playing, me and my sister were playing uh, piano since I was seven years old. And uh, what happened was that when the Nazis came in, and they wanted to take the piano. And we had it by then, a co my cousin living with us, he was by then 17 years old and he was singing very well and playing the piano very well. And he played for them and they said, no, 
somebody who's so talented, we're not going to take it away. As a result, the piano survived the war at our Christian friends, and then we brought it back and sold it, and we were able to uh, have some money when we were leaving Poland for, is for Israel. From there on, they took my father and my sister, they would catch people on the street and they send them to work, uh, whatever it was, to, to different uh, locations. And they took my father and my sister, and that was the last time we have seen them. And they were building the barracks for Schindler, who at the time was still in Krakow and had his factory in Krakow. And uh, once they took them, I stayed with my mother and I wanted a job for my mother because uh, we heard that they will be recycling the ghetto. They will take us all to the concentration camp, the Płaszów. And we were worrying that we would uh, have a crisis and, and we will have to uh, get to, uh, you know, uh, in order to, to get into Puasha, to get into the camp, we had to have an employment. And once they took my, my father and my sister, I don't know why at that time I went the one who came, went to the Arbeitsamt, what they call it, which was the employment office, and asked for a job for my mother. And luckily she was assigned to the same brush factory that I was working. And a few months passed by after they left and they announced that they're liquidating the ghetto. And we had to march a few miles from Krakow, from Krakow ghetto to the Kwashov concentration camp. And as we were going from Płaszów, to, from uh, the ghetto to Płaszów, all of a sudden my mother noticed that she lost her pocketbook with her papers and her working papers were in it. And that was a tremendous disaster because without it, she could never enter the camp. So we were very afraid that this would be a problem. But luckily what happened that all of a sudden we heard her name being called by a friend of mine. She found the packet book and looked inside and found my mother's working papers and knew that this, this meant life and was looking for us to turn it into my mother, which she did, and we were both able to enter the camp. It sounds ridiculous when you think about it, that entering the camp was the big prize, but the point is that at that moment, this was the time that gave us still the right to live. And we entered the camp and started working in the brush factory. And we weren't in the camp for a very long time, less day, than a year. But during the high holidays, they, they, were, they forbid us to, to pray or to have any, any services, any, any observances. And we, the brush factory was, all, was owned by Hasidic Jews who were very religious and high holidays came. They, they took us to the camp in May and this was in October when the high holidays came. And they insisted that they're not going to be working and that they will openly pray. And they brought their praying shawls, but our barracks were very low and you could see through the windows what was going on inside because they weren't all ready to entered the camp so easily because they were very much worried, uh, you know, they didn't want the contamination, whatever it was, but spotting the people praying in the, in the prayer shores prompted them to enter the, uh, the brush factory. And there 
was a tremendous slaughter. They killed few people and they were beating very badly few people. Among the people who was receiving a very big beating was a young groom who probably was late teenager and his wife wanted to protect him came to his rescue, was trying to come to his rescue. And because she came to his rescue, he was shot on the spot. And uh, they were very shortly after the wedding and, and so she lost him right away on that. And this was a very tragic moment. And I was sitting at the bench right by the door and everybody that could during all this turmoil was running away, trying to escape. But I didn't want to escape because mother was sitting deep in the room and she couldn't escape and I didn't want to leave her there and, and escape myself. And I heard that some one of the people who did the shooting stopped behind me and then I heard a click thinking that probably he took a cigarette after shooting people to kind of relax. And I didn't say one word and my mother, I saw she was absolutely white like a chalk and didn't re react to anything, didn't say one word. And I couldn't quite understand what was going on. And it showed up that he stood behind my head he pulled out the gun, put it to my head, ready to shoot me. And because nobody reacted, he came to conclusion that this wasn't what his bullet in the gun and he left without shooting me. But we had to, to work and we had to witness all kinds of atrocities and came for and they were shipping us. They took a group of people to ship to Skarzysko, which was an under, underwater mine factory. I was at first working at the, what they call the grenades. We were putting the at and into grenades, which was fairly decent job because me and a friend of mine, Mala Sperling, who lives in war in New Jersey, in uh, Clark, New Jersey. Uh, we were assigned to hit the paraffin that kept the at and in place. And it looked like we had a, a fairly decent job because we were in a warm spot while everybody was working with all the doors and windows, everything open. So we thought that, that we are pretty safe and it's pretty good, but this was just a delusion because shortly after one of the SS people came in and grabbed me and shipped me out to another area where they were doing underwater mines. The underwater mines were made from picric acid, which was extremely poisonous. And uh, like anybody else who was working with that material, I got very ill. I, my lungs were affected and it became very dangerous for me to work. When the time has come that they were going to ship us from there to Germany because in the meantime, the Russian forces were coming toward Poland and they were stationed not very far away from us. And uh, we were, so we heard that we are going to be shipped and everybody was very, very distressed about it. And I was at the time at the hospital and there was a po Jewish policeman who was leading a group of Nazis to come and select, take everybody from the barrack and send us all on a shooting range. He knew me because he met me when I first arrived at the camp and we always had very big conversation because he was uh, assistant commandant of the, get of the camp and I 
considered that he had very privileged existence, which he did. He had better supply of food and he had decent clothes and decent housing. And I would always tell him that how, how horrible it was that he utilized this his position to, to have a better life than the rest of us and always had big discussion with him. But when they were coming to empty the hospital and send everybody to the shooting range to be shot, I ran away and uh, because he took me in my nightgown from my shift, from my bed and threw me through the back door and let me escape. And three days later, they sent us up to, to the camp in Leipzig. In Leipzig, the conditions were much, much better because this was an economic decision of the Nazis because they needed the working hands in the ammunition factory because people were, the, you know, the German people were taken to the army and they, they didn't have the, the manpower to, to work in the camps. So they gave a, put us there, and this was only a metal company. So there was no poisonous, and I, because of that, I kind of recovered, and and my lungs came back to normal, and uh, I was in a much much better shape uh, in Leipzig. But when the war ended, we were. We were assigned to to a very, very, before the war ended, we were shipped out of Leipzig, what we call the death march, because the, they took us on a, on a march I'd, for quite a long time. I don't know what was one or two weeks. I, I don't, time didn't mean anything to us. And they were marching us almost like in circles because they felt that uh, this way it gave them a protection from going to the front line. And finally, one day, they decided to abandon us in a barn. That was the first time that we were allowed not to march through the night and could lay down and, and relax. and but there was no food at all. And what happened was that the foreman of the group of the estate was the only one left. The owners were gone, they escaped someplace. And he came over and said, look, the war is over. The Russians are passing by. They were on a motorcycle and they grabbed him and put the gun to his head and said, now you have to give those women some food and help them locate in individual homes. Because this is, we were 300 women in the barn uh, laying on straw and, and we, we didn't have any food at first, but everybody was so exhausted that it just didn't matter. But the time has come for, for us to get some shelter and, and uh, be taken care of. And, and uh, he was ordered to supply it within a few days. So they divided us into groups of six, eight, and sent us to peasants. And we were staying over there probably about a week or so. And we had to go from one village to the other to, for bread because the village we were in did not have a bakery, so there was no bread. And one day I was going along with my friend, Mali Spelling, the one that I mentioned before, who lived in a, a, not far away in Clark in New Jersey. And... Uh, as we were walking, we were wearing our prison dresses, obviously, the way we were normally. And I embroidered my number with threads from the, uh, from the mattress because we had straw mattresses. So actually, they were just 
burla bags and there was some black writing so i pulled out the threads from the black light writing and embroidered my number so it would not wash out because you would be punished if they would know your number and uh, we were going dressed in in those uh, striped dresses in our prison dresses and we came across russian soldiers and the soldiers looked at us and said, how come are you wearing the prison dresses? So we looked in surprise. We didn't have anything else. And uh, we thought this is the only thing that we have and that's the only thing we need to wear. But it showed up that he told us that the war is over, that we don't have to wear the prison dresses. We dropped the wagon, we dropped everything, and we ran back to town to tell the people that the war is over. It was unbelievable because there was no radio, there was no communication, there was no way for us to reach any, no news was reaching us. And the people in the village didn't know any better than we did. And we were absolutely overjoyed hearing that the war was over. We were in a no man's land between two nations, between the Russian occupation and British occupation. And there was like a strip of land between those two occupied zones that was independent zone. And we were all happy that we can stay there. We are free. But it didn't last very long because the Russians found that there were a lot of women around and they decided they're going to come and they, they're going to have a ball with the girls and, and they will enjoy themselves. And the evening came and a commandant of the area came with a whole entourage and he decided that since... Uh, we were the ones, they, they endangered their life to, to liberate us. We owe it to them to, to sleep with them. And I was at the time 18 years old and I was with my mother and I wasn't going to sleep with a, with a Russian officer just in front of my mother like that. This was awful. Uh, so I got him very, very drunk. And he brought a big diamond that he wrapped from a German home and was ready to present me with the diamond as a reward. And one of the other women, who I thought was an old woman, she was probably in her late 20s, and she saw the big diamond and decided that, that she wanted. And I can't blame her because we didn't have penny to our name and we didn't have any anything to, to get out from there, this was the only kind of a thread of, of, of some possession. So she did sleep with him. In the morning, she got up and started yelling at me that because of me, he raped her. He never raped her, but that was her saving, saving her face that way. But by noon, there was a doctor who was in his entourage, a Jewish doctor, and he came running and brought two valises, one for my mother and one for, my, for me. And he must have been a married man because he had the, each one of the valises had clothes for all the four seasons. There weren't uh, enormous valises, but at least some clothes that we wouldn't have to work in our prison dresses. And he said, you better get out of here immediately because he's planning to come tonight with vengeance because you know what you did to him. He realized that this was a trick on your part and uh, he is coming to, to pay the price, for you to pay the price. Uh, so we right away packed up and went we walked for many miles to the next town where there were trains and there were empty trains. There were just platforms that were going back to the east for another shipment, for another platform. Uh, 
because they were that's how they were transporting things from Russia for the soldiers to have food and to have weapons or whatever was needed. And we boarded that plane. Obviously, there was no no payments. The, everything was free. Everything was you, you just hopped on it and 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 you went. And we went uh, right away and went in the direction of Poland, trying to see who from the family survived. I did not learn that my sister was killed for a number of years later. We suspected that she did not survive because the house the, which we, where we lived before the war was a house built by my grandfather and a spot where the family owned this land from maybe a few hundred years. And we knew that if anybody survived from the family, this is where they will all come and they will all look for each other. And we never heard anything either from my mother or from my father or from my sister. My father, we found out quite soon after that, that he went together with another friend uh, to Auschwitz and he was executed in the, uh, in the crematoria in Auschwitz. My sister, as I said, I, we didn't find out for a number of years that she was, she was uh, one of the last victims of the Holocaust. There was a camp by the seashore, Stutthof, and when they, the front was progressing, they loaded all the women on a ship and they sunk the ship in the Baltic Sea. They supposedly were trying to bring them to Sweden, to Sweden to get some medical help, but they never made it. But that, that I didn't find out for maybe almost 10 years after the war, because I couldn't track down at all any place, anybody who would know anything about my sister. But the... I survived with my mother and I was very grateful that we were together and that there was somebody that, that, uh, that I had to my name, which was very rare in those things because people were really killed left and right and, and very frequently, like my friend Mali, she, sur she survived with absolutely nobody, not, not an in nobody from her immediate family she had only one cousin who was born in America during the war, but otherwise she, she didn't have anybody. So I ride away, we ride away, packed up, and we tried to settle in Krakow. We, we were living originally in the center of town and we had a beautiful apartment, the house that my grandfather built. And we were hoping that we might be able to stay there, but the people whom we gave the apartment when they had to go west uh, during the war uh, would not let us in because they didn't want to leave with, with anybody else. They wanted the apartment to themselves. And we were too tired and mother was very ill. She was in the hospital, she had the very badly injured legs. And she decided, we decided we're not going to fight. And they assigned us to a little one bedroom in a courtyard of a building that was rat infested. And uh, we didn't pay any attention. That was good enough as long as we had a head over our head. And we had a bathroom that we had to share with the bar. So came evening, you couldn't possibly go to the bathroom because the, the drunks would occupy the bathroom. It was horrible. But uh, we lived like that for five years. It, uh, no, we were happy we had a roof over our head. And my mother immediately said, you have to go to school. You have to get education because I only finished sixth grade. And being that the only opportunity that I had to uh, 
study anything was music since I played the piano since I was seven years old. So I enrolled at the conservatory and the musicology at the university, and they gave us one year to make a high school diplomacy, a high school graduation diploma. And I was working very, very hard, and I am very grateful that I did. And uh, by the time I was finishing the, my education, the opportunity came to go to Israel. Israel was created in 48, and I finished, graduated from college in 49. And I had the opportunity now to go to Israel carrying a diploma from both conservatory and the, and the musicology from the university. And the only thing is that nobody in Israel at that time in 1949 needed a musicologist. As a, you know, th this was not, not a good investment of time. But I really felt that I had some legs to stand on because I felt I had some education. I would like to stop now and see if there anybody has any questions because, uh, you know, I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs>So one question that came up has to do with the similarities and differences between the Jewish experience and the experience of the Roma and Sinti people who were you know, previously known um, by the derogatory gypsy um, during the Holocaust. And both of these groups suffered tremendously um, by persecution, by the Nazis and their collaborators. Um, a key difference is the reason that the groups were being targeted. Um, so it's often said that not all victims were Jewish, um, but all Jews were victims. Yeah. There was absolutely nothing you know, that a Jewish person could do um, to avoid the state. They couldn't change. It didn't matter if you changed the religion that you practiced, if you converted, um, if you adhered to any change, it didn't matter. You were going to be targeted. And members of the Roma and Sinti community were targeted allegedly because of their um, lifestyle, that they were considered a social people who couldn't adapt yeah. to the norms of society. Countless numbers, and we don't know the numbers, of Roma and Sinti people were forcibly sterilized as a way of trying to end the community. Many did experience time you know, in concentration camps and many were killed. Um, you know, a big difference is again, the way um, the genocide has been remembered um, by both communities. And um, there is a question, um, how did so many educated middle-class Aryan Germans tolerate the singling out and extermination of Jewish friends and neighbors? So I think that's a really complicated question because there isn't a single answer. Um, there were some people who were certainly motivated perhaps by greed, by personal hate, ideology that they had believed in from long before the Holocaust began. Um, when I started our program tonight, I spoke about anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism being the oldest hatred. So this was something that was already embedded you know, in many cultures, regardless of how civilized or educated a people are. Um, we know civilized and educated people are not immune to hate. Again, if we go back to World War I and we talk about um, you know, Germany's loss um, and the forced acceptance of responsibility with the Treaty of Versailles for the damages of World War One. A common myth um, or sort of stanza that emerged from this was the idea of the stab in the back theory, that German Jews did not um, do their part in fighting the war and that they were therefore responsible for the loss, for Germany's defeat. This is false. Um, but what we have to remember is what happened after World War I that set the stage for the Holocaust. The world sunk into a deep depression. We had the Great Depression in Germany. Um, inflation was at higher rates than we've ever seen in historically. People were economically depressed. Um, Germany had experienced so many losses and they were looking for a scapegoat. 
Um, you had the Jewish community, which was well established in Germany. This, they, most of them were native to the country. They spoke the language. Their children went to school together. They worked together. Um, they became really an easy target because they were the only major minority group, minority community in the region. And so what might have began um, you know, as sort of fear, fear of the other, um, fear of the world that they were living in and was opportunistic. Um, but very few people, we need to recall, voted for the Nazi party you know, in the early 1930s because they had any desire to destroy the Jews of Europe. This was not part of the official Nazi party platform. I want to say that people then wanted to make their lives better. They wanted to see a situation where they were better. And in that sense, it's, I don't want to place blame. I don't want to place anything either way. It's just the fact that they felt that they were struggling and any way to make their situation seem a little bit more palatable, a little bit more easy for them and their families. And if you're given an opportunity to make your family's life better or told you're, you have an opportunity to make your family's life better, you can, you want to accept that. And it's a problem because people prioritize themselves and their own situation more than others. Those individuals felt that the, the Nazi party could do what others couldn't do. And so I don't think that they were all evil. I don't think they were all, they all hated Jews. They just wanted themselves to be better. And the Nazi party was presenting that to them. It's very interesting. There is a marvelous movie done by Lenny Riefenstahl, who was the official photographer and for filmmaker for Hitler, where he, they analyzed the rise of Nazism, how innocent it sounded. And if you watch it today without knowing what happened in Germany, you will think that this is the most fa fantastic regime that ever existed because you don't look at the results. You look at the method which they employed, which sounded so innocent and so wonderful for the whole world. But unfortunately, it wasn't. You have to read between the lines to see what's coming. Thank you, Luna. Um, a few people are asking questions about the education system. Um, and you know, in a nutshell, um, New Jersey happens to be where we are, you know, located in New Jersey and New York are states that mandate Holocaust education. Um, but we are only two states out of 18 in the country um, that do so. And even amongst that, there are so many variants um, on what people actually um, learn the good news is that in the United States, at least, there is tremendous, there's a tremendous amount of resources that are available um, to individuals, to schools that wish to study you know, and teach about the Holocaust. You know, I would encourage people um, who are asking you know, some questions to really take some time to go through the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum website, um, where there's certain questions where they have a Holocaust encyclopedia that you can go in. This is a very valuable tool. Um, I think it was designed originally for students, but I really think for all of us. Um, and this is something we go to as well as Holocaust educators because nobody has all the answers. Um, we are constantly learning new facts. Um, there was also you know, a question about um, resistance. And I think, you know, I understand that we are, you know, just past eight. But I do want to make a point that to say that there was resistance, um, that Jewish people resisted in myriad ways, um, going from a physical armed resistance when we think about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising um, on the eve of Passover in 1943, when you know, surviving you know, prisoners in the Warsaw Ghetto fought back. And they fought back for more than a month. You know, against the Nazi occupiers who were trying to take them down. There was the blowing up of the crematoria at Auschwitz-Birkenau. There were revolts at Sobibor. We have stories about the partisans, um, so Jews and non-Jews who were fighting you know, in the forests of, of Eastern Europe. We must also think, and maybe this ties to education, 
And I think, you know, Luna, your experience of you know, continuing education um, despite persecution, parents that insisted that their kids continue to learn, even if they were in the ghettos, even if there was very little chance that they would emerge alive from the ghettos, that didn't stop parents from teaching children, from passing on you know, languages, um, and from you know, arts, culture, you know, still maintaining their humanity um, is a very important form of resistance that we, we can't forget about. I completely agree with that. I also want to say that there is a cultural resistance, that the idea of the Germans and the Nazis was to get rid of all Judaism. So we have instances where Jews were teaching, rabbis were teaching young boys how to read from the Torah to have a bar mitzvah at the age of 13 with their coming of age story. And we have situations where they were celebrating Shabbat, the Jew, um, the Jewish day of rest and lighting candles on Friday night, as well as observing the Passover holiday, um, the, which celebrates coming out of the slavery from Egypt, where even in the, with the meekest of food that they were given, they would refrain from eating the bread and only eat the soup, the watered down soup that they would have because they wanted to keep their religion. And what the Nazis wanted to do was not just, was not just simply murder, but to eliminate all of Judaism. So in terms of resistance, we had, we saw a tremendous amount of that both in armed resistance, like um, Dr. Goldberg said, as well as in a cultural resistance in terms of staying with who they were and keeping true to their Jewish faith. Um, Luna, would you like to add anything in terms of resistance that you might remember or have seen? As, as you know, I was very young, so those things were not privy for me to know. As a matter of fact, I had cousins who were in the leadership of the Krakow resistance, and there is very little know about the Krakow resistance and, and killing of the Nazis and so far. Somehow, this didn't get into books and it didn't get any, any acknowledgement. Uh, were, there is so much to talk about that things get lost a little in the shuffle. But uh, the spirit... Do you know that we left concentration camp with quite an education? We didn't have books, we didn't have a penny, we didn't have a pencil. But at night when the lights went up, the well-educated women would sit in the middle of the, of the barracks and tell us the, the best novels, the best writing, the best art, and tell us about those things. And when we left the, the camp, we knew things that you would learn normally in school because they were so eager to let us develop and to grow. And I was, I'm forever grateful to my mother that she was really, we had a tremendously hard time, hardly any money to live on. And yet she made a point that I went to school, that I got education that I worked with the intelligent people. And uh, it served me very well. As a, as a matter of fact, one of, uh, you know, I changed my occupation every five years. And one of them, I wound up to be a president of the New Jersey State Opera. And I stayed with the opera till I produced two pieces of music that were important for me. One was, an opera about Frederick Douglass written by a black composer, Ulysses K., who was a student of Hindemith. And the other one was Brundibar, a children's opera re re written in Theresienstadt concentration camp um, by uh, Jan Krasa, who was then killed at Auschwitz. And I felt that I made my point and now time went to move on. So I moved on to Seton Hall because I found that Sister Rose was forming a marvelous group of people, Christians at the Catholic University where they were educating about Holocaust and about uh, brotherhood and, uh, and about reaching to each other. So there is always a 
a bridge between one and the other. And this is what we need to learn, that we need to coexist and we need to, to reach out to each other. Well, I guess uh, all good things must come to come to a close. There are uh, actually a lot of questions in the uh, Q&A box, but uh, we're not going to be able to get to all of them in this session. Let me uh, try to close it by thanking all our speakers, uh, certainly Luna, Adara, uh, Elise, and Jamie um, uh, from, the, uh, from the Jewish uh, Federation of Metro West. Adara, thank you for uh, setting the scene for uh, Luna's talk and for curating the questions and uh, for keeping us uh, all on, uh, on track. Uh, we are very much obliged for uh, you helping us conduct this session. Uh, Liz, thank you also for the same, for, uh, for making all your resources available to us for this session. And Luna, uh, what can we say about you? Uh, I think you've heard it probably many, many, many times um, before, but uh, let me just say you're simply amazing. The Holocaust obviously is a uh, deeply shameful scar on the humanity. Um, it was gruesome, uh, gut-wrenching uh, tale of horrors. And of course, not only for the Jewish community, for, but for the world at large. And in your case, you were not just a casual observer of it. You were very much in it and uh, uh, you suffered in a deeply personal way. And yet, uh, somehow, you managed to find the courage to talk about it in such a lucid and matter-of-factly manner. I just don't know how you, could, how you do it. So hats off to you. <clears throat> I love your message of uh, us looking inside to cleanse our souls, to you know, look deep down and say, do we, do we hold hatred for others and what the reasons for that are and what that leads to? I wish the world uh, would listen to you. The fact of the matter is uh, there is as much hate, perhaps even more than it's ever been in the world. Unfortunately, that message is not sticking and it's just too bad. Now, we wanted to share this stage, um, you know, with, uh, with our Jewish friends uh, for, uh, because we feel that we have a lot in common. Actually, the two communities have a lot in common. And uh, we have a lot to learn from each other, certainly we uh, from the Jewish community. I won't bore you with, you know, some of the well-known facts of shared history, you know, a small community of Jews having lived in India for, you know, 2000 years in peace, perhaps the only society where they might have lived in peace. Uh, I really uh, wanted to focus tonight on the shared trauma of uh, attempt by others to exterminate us to eliminate our respective civilizations out of existence. You see, Hindu community is not uh, entirely unfamiliar with attempts to exterminate their people as well as their culture. And on a scale that is too massive to contemplate. And that too in their own homeland. And that too by people who were primitive on a civilization scale, with the exception of uh, the military tactics. Now, there's probably a lesson right there, perhaps, for all communities to learn. Perhaps being militarily, militarily strong and being able to protect yourself is the very first thing we can do to survive. So the point is that uh, both Hindus and Jews have endured the trauma of attempted genocides, but with one big difference. Jews have chosen to talk about their uh, experiences, whereas Hindus have chosen to bury theirs deep down in their psyche. So uh, one could perhaps try to rationalize the Hindu uh, reaction by saying, well, it happened a long time ago in history, and you tend to forget, you don't have people who can talk about it. Unfortunately, they wish that were only true, because it is happening right today. Uh, it's happening in neighboring con uh, countries, neighboring on India, it happened 30 years ago, half a million people were kicked out of their homes in Kashmir, and they're still living in uh, uh, refugee camps. Uh, to make matters worse, there is all kinds of dehumanizing narrative that is being raised against Hindus all over the world as we speak. In not, not academia, in news uh, media, social media, and all other domains. And it eerily feels like what Jewish community might have experienced going into the Second World War. 
So tonight, I just want to uh, close this conversation by asking uh, two or three related questions. Somewhere along the way, the Jewish community decided to talk about their experiences, to document it, to daylight it. And uh, I think it was an extremely important decision and a bold one, I think. My question is, uh, how did the Jewish community come to that decision? Was it some sort of an organic movement from the survivors or was there an organizational initiative that led to it? And was the Jewish community unanimously behind that decision or were there a lot of dissensions? Finally, how long did it take for the individuals as well as the community to come out of their shell and start talking about their experiences? Sorry, too many questions. Hopefully uh, you got the gist of what, we're trying, what I'm trying to get at and see if you can uh, take some of them for me. Thank you. I was just going to say, um, sort of, you know, in a nutshell, you know, different people have spoken up at different times. So when we talk about, you know, commemoration of the Holocaust, this was already happening while the Holocaust was still ongoing and parts of Europe that were liberated. And this was happening overseas, you know, with friends and relatives of those who were under attack, you know, commemorating and honoring, you know, their lost loved ones. Um, and there is a common myth that most survivors did not want to speak. And while there's certainly those who did not want to, who chose not to, I mean, that was their choice to make. Um, there were always people speaking up. There were always those who were trying to share their story, whether or not the broader community listened um, is a very different case. Um, but typically we see, you know, the late 1970s, um, the movie, you know, Holocaust, the uh, mini series Holocaust, was many people's first introduction to you know, the Holocaust as not just a Jewish event, but rather something that you know, affected the entire world. I and mean, then it's something that we need to care about um, as society. And this is not just you know, a Jewish matter, um, but I think it also takes many people, you know, it takes time. The survivors who emerged, you know, like Luna um, had came from nothing. There was nothing left. Um, so your time and energy had to be spent you know, trying to rebuild your life. <clears throat> and before you can do anything else with your life, you need to know that you're safe, that your family is safe, that you're secure. Um, and I think you know, for many people that I, I've worked with, I mean, it's only much later, especially around retirement, when people have more time um, to share and when there's more reception for others. Okay. So I I want to agree with that. I want to say that the Holocaust is by far the most documented historical event, human tragedy, historical event that we've had in history. And I think it's a combination of a lot of things. And I don't just think that it comes from the Jewish community. I think it comes from, yes, the Jewish community, but also a broader community that wanted to understand and remember how massive of an event it was. It was not just six million Jews that were murdered. It was probably what we put historians put as six million others that were also murdered at the hands of the Nazis. And I think that as a whole, that's something that human society wanted to understand and recognize. And I agree with Dr. Goldberg that it did not just come from the Jewish community or from one place that it came from survivors over time in various different ways. And I will end by saying for Luna and let her speak for herself, that it took a lot of survivors different amounts of time to speak about what they went to. It was a very personal thing. And here in the state of New Jersey, we are so fortunate that we had so many survivors that came here, that rebuilt their lives, and that continued to talk about what happened to them. And so as we conclude, I think it's important to hear from a survivor herself, to hear from Luna about why it was so important to speak about that at this time. I think that it needed to mature. People had too deep a wounds to speak at first, and some of them still cannot speak about it. But I felt that it was extremely important that we address the issue. And I remember when they first asked me to come to Watron Hills High School in the 70s to talk about the Holocaust experience, I couldn't figure out why would they want to know anything about it. 
But I learned very shortly after that that the prejudice has to be fought. And in order to fight the prejudice, you have to expose what was the result of prejudice. And I'm very grateful that, you know, it's very funny that the Holocaust Commission was really started when we op when we had the unveiling of the Rappaport sculpture in, in our temple, when we offered to build the Rappaport sculptures in our temple as a donation, because we were the only survived at the, at the Plainfield Temple, it really occurred to me that we need to memorialize, memorialize it. And when we invited Governor Kane to come, I didn't know anything about him. I just, he was in the office only for a few months when this happened. And I invited him thinking that it will add the prestige and it will open the door to the community to come for the event, which it did. What I didn't know that his father, together with Senator Dirksen, wanted to press a legislation to came, come to help of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising in order to help them in their fight. And it was defeated. It did not, uh, it did not pass the, uh, in the Senate. And Governor Kane, being a historian, was then a young man when, when uh, took off, he took office as a governor. And because of the sculpture of Rappaport decided that he will form the Holocaust Commission. And that's how this whole thing. And we were the first one, first uh, state in the nation that did it. It's uh, almost half past eight. Uh, so I think we're gonna close the, uh, the webinar. Uh, so uh, let me once again, thank uh, all our panelists, especially Luna for, for sharing her, uh, uh, experiences with us and and of course thanks to all the participants who joined us uh, in this webinar and until next time thank you once again good night good night